Uh, let me pray and then we'll, we'll jump into the text. If you brought a Bible or you have a Bible app, we're going to be in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. Lord, we want to invite you to speak today. Nobody came to hear me speak. So God, would you speak? Would you uh, work powerfully? Would you reshape our thinking? Would you reorganize our life so that today matters? So that this matters? God, because if, if you don't show up, if you don't speak, if you don't move, God, we're just being entertained or bored. <laughs> so God, we love you and we invite your influence uh, into our life. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Okay. Um, we are finishing a series today uh, called The Good, the Bad, the Ugly. And what we've uh, discovered so far throughout this series is that rather than editing out the, uh, the messiness and the sinfulness of humans, the Bible seems to highlight the failures and sins of, uh, of, of us humans, right? And it's, and it's almost as if God is saying, hey, my love... And my forgiveness is much bigger and much more powerful than any sin you could ever uh, commit, right? And rather than punishing us for making a mistake or uh, making a bad decision or, or, or um, living in a cycle of sin, God is interested in um, uh, forgiving us our sins and bringing healing and wholeness to the to the part of our heart that, that gives birth to unhealthy cravings, okay? And so today, we're going to look at another really imperfect leader from the Bible and learn how to give the right people the right level of influence in our lives, okay? Um, l- let me tell you a story. I did not grow up going to church, uh, nor did I know much about Jesus and certainly didn't uh, understand that he loved me personally, And so at 17, a friend of mine invited me to go to church, Adam Sani, his invitation changed my life. And I, I would, I would, after a series of, you know, church things and youth group things and lots of questions and conversations, I decided I'm going to give my life to this Jesus. And so I did. And so for a year, I followed Jesus as faithfully as I knew how. Uh, I built some amazing friendships with some uh, with Adam and a gal named Amy Hannon, and, and together we would pray together, we would study the Bible together, we would go to church together, and we would do the, uh, our best to follow Jesus together, okay? And so that was the, my senior year of high school. Then, then what happened? They went off to college, and I, I was left in the Northwest to kind of fend for myself. I no longer had the encouragement and the spiritual support that came so naturally from those friendships um, and so, and so I tried my best to follow Jesus and go to church all by myself. And, uh, because I spent most of my time after graduating high school at, at work, I developed these, these, um, uh, fun, uh, relationships with some, some, some folks that I worked with. And I was spending more time with them than the people I was connecting with at church. And eventually my work relationships um, uh, went beyond work, which was awesome, but they really liked to, to drink and smoke and party. And that actually, can you believe it, had an influence on the decisions I was making, right? I wanted to, I remember, you know, shortly after my friends moved away from college, I found myself actually sneaking out of my house and smoking a cigarette. And I remember, uh, uh, partying and drinking like two to three times a week and then living under this kind of cloud of depression. And guess what? I didn't tell anybody about it. I lived, in, I, lived, I lived in the cage of my own secrets and I found myself disconnected from my family and disconnected from my church. And rather than running to God, what did I do? I was embarrassed. I ran away from God. And, and so I, I loved, man, I wanted to follow Jesus but I really did love my work friends. And the problem was I didn't have the framework or the relational structure present in my life to be able to do both, follow Jesus and love my friends, my, my work friends. And so I, I just want to clarify, my life 
and my decisions and my attitudes and my actions are my responsibility. Not uh, your responsibility, uh, not my wife's responsibility, not my parents' responsibility, and my, my actions at that season of time wasn't my work friend's responsibility. My life was and is and will be my responsibility. But because my work friends were the closest people to me in, in that season of my life, I found myself doing the same things that they were doing. And I, and I found myself asking this question, how in the world did I end up here? How did I end up here? Have you ever wondered that? You, you found yourself in a, in, a, in, a, in a place, in a situation, or in a position of responsibility, and you're like, man, how in the world did I end up here? And for, for most of us, we have like positive examples of, man, this I'm so fortunate. How did I end up here? And others of us, like my story, can be like, man, my life is a mess. How did I end up here? How did I end up here? Maybe for you, it's you've created this habit of spending more than you make, and now uh, you're living under a load of debt and you're avoiding those collection calls. And you're wondering, man, how in the world did I end up here? Or maybe for you, you had a dream and an and a, and intention of, of having a lifelong and enjoyable marriage. Um, but today, you're looking at a, a, a possible divorce and you're wondering, man, how in the world did we end up here? Or maybe it's a health thing or a weight thing or an anger thing. Or maybe what started out as a simple escape um, and a simple pleasure has, has uh, become a full-blown addiction or an affair. And you're like, man, how in the world did I end up here? Or maybe for you, um, y- your life has become so busy uh, and you're now, you used to follow Jesus, but now you find your, yourself in a place in your life where you're, you're disconnected from God and you don't have time in your, in your life for meaningful friendships that will help you grow in your faith. And you're wondering, man, how in the world did I end up here? You know, how did I end up here? Let me, let me say this. There are many uh, factors, variables, and forces that explain why we end up in a certain place or a certain um, uh, situation in our life. But one of the most uh, uh, strongest forces that will determine the, the quality and the direction of your life is actually uh, the quality of the people we give permission to influence our life. Okay, and so today we're gonna we're gonna meet a guy by the name of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, you've never heard of him before, and um, and that's okay. But Rehoboam, and he's got he's got a cool name. Just say it real quick, Rehoboam. Oh, that was pretty fun, wasn't it? Right, Rehoboam. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay, Rehoboam is actually. Uh, uh, King Solomon's son, uh, Solomon was, was known for his wisdom and his wealth, um, and, and, and Rehoboam is actually next in line to become the, uh, the, the next king of Israel, okay? Uh, but Rehoboam has a really, really important decision to make, and the question is, uh, who uh, will he, who will Rehoboam invite into his life to have influence over this decision-making process, okay? So uh, pick up with me in, um, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12. It will pop up here on the screen. Um, Rehoboam, just say it one more time. It's so fun. Rehoboam, yeah, it's so fun. Okay, there's another guy named Jeroboam in the same story, so don't get confused, okay? Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel had gone there to make him king, when Jeroboam, uh-oh, there's that guy, uh, son of Nebat, heard this. He was still in Egypt where he had uh, fled from King Solomon. He returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam, okay, the, the, the king guy, and said to him, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us and we will serve you. And Rehoboam, so real quick, uh, just to give this a little bit of context, um, it, it seems as though in order to be the king uh, over the United Kingdom of Israel, uh, the, the, the king needed affirmation from the southern part of the kingdom, Judah, and the northern part of the, of the kingdom, Israel, okay? And from what we can tell, 
Rehoboam has already been affirmed in the southern part of the kingdom, so he has to go to Shechem, which is in the northern part of the kingdom, and be affirmed in that section of, of the kingdom. Okay, does that make sense? So that's what's happening. He's got affirmation in the south. He's going up north to get affirmation from the rest, but he now has a decision to make. Am I going to, am, am I going to lighten the load that my father put on him? Verse 5, it says, Rehoboam answered, go away uh, for, for three days, and then come back to me. So the people went away. Okay, now I love this because Rehoboam has a big decision to make, right? Big decision to make. And um, the answer to this decision actually determines how the people of the northern part of the kingdom are going to respond to Rehoboam. And so what does he do? He actually creates space to make a good decision. Rather than making a decision on the spot, he says, hey, give me three days and um, I'm going to counsel with some other folks, okay? So let me ask you, what decision is, uh, are you trying to make right now, okay? What decision are you trying to make in your life right now? Are, are, you, you know, are, you, are you making a financial decision? Are you making a decision about your kid's school? Maybe you're here and you're like, man, should I, um, do I like the refinery? Should I make the refinery in my home church? But we all have a decision uh, uh, or decisions that we have to uh, decide in our life. And it's always wise to actually take some time and create some space and margin so that we can consult, uh, get feedback and counsel before making these big decisions. Too many people are making um, uh, uh, emotional and uh, uh, impulsive decisions in isolation, right? They're buying cars they can't afford. They're moving states because of politics or paycheck. And they haven't even invited anybody in to that decision-making process. Um, uh, and, and, and it's not that we give veto power to other people to make decisions uh, for, for us, but, but it is a permission to say, hey, um, I have a big thing going on. Would you pray for me? Would you ask me difficult questions? Uh, and, 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 and it's giving them a, a level of influence when it comes to making these decisions in your life right? A few years back, uh, uh, some friends of mine were leading a community group, which is basically a small group of friends who are trying to grow in their faith together, okay? And uh, at the end of the gathering, they were like, hey, um, any prayer requests, you know? And one of the couples who is, they, you know, they're followers of Jesus, they're like, oh yeah, so we're so excited. We've been planning, we've been preparing, we've been praying, and we've decided to open up a marijuana dispensary, now, listen, I think when Jesus uh, told us to pray that heaven would make its way to earth, he wasn't saying humans need easier access to drugs, right? We need to invite people into the process of, of helping us discern uh, uh, the wise decision to make, and God's will for our, uh, for our life, okay? Um, uh, people that, that love us and people that we trust. Okay. So, so who does Rehoboam invite into his life? Who, who does he invite into his life? Uh, verse six, then the king, uh, sorry, then King Rehoboam consulted the elders. Good job, Rehoboam, who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people? He asked, but then they replied, if today you will be a servant to these people, and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always uh, be your servants or they, will be, they, they would love to follow after you. Again, another great decision to consult the, the, the wise and experienced elders that Rehoboam has access to. And so let me ask you, who are the wise people in your life? I mean, who are those people who have experienced they're men and women of character who you trust and they actually want what's best for you in God's eyes, okay? Uh, is there someone in your life who, when you, when you look at their life, you respect the way that they steward their finances? Is there somebody in your life who you're like, man, I really respect the way that they um, are, connect with God and, and, and they're faithful uh, to follow Jesus? Or is there somebody in your life you're like, man, I really want to grow my leadership and there's a couple of, of men and women in my world who I could probably learn a thing or two. So you, you seek them out. Or maybe for you, it's, 
it's, it's, a, it's a family who you just you love them and you respect them. And so you need to seek them out and ask the question, man, what's the, what are the secrets of becoming uh, the intentional parents that you are? that you are. I'd encourage you, listen, I'd encourage you to find these people and then create a panel of mentors that you can periodically reach out to for wisdom and discernment and for help to navigate these difficult decisions and uh, direction in your life, okay? Uh, We're going to set that aside and we'll come back to this panel of mentors idea uh, later on, okay? So uh, what does Rehoboam do with the advice that he gets from the the elders. It says this in verse 8, but Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders. Man, darn it, okay? Uh, And and he consulted with the young men who who he had grown up with, I'm sorry, who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, hey, what is your advice and how should uh, we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke of your father that your father put on us. Verse 10, the young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them my my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Verse 11, my father laid on you a heavy yoke. Now I will make it even heavier. And my father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Okay, so while Rehoboam has access to, to the wise and experienced elders in his community, um, it seems as though he had already made up his mind and was now just looking for validation. And so he rejects rejects the wisdom of the elders and he finds uh, validation and justification in a group of guys he's been hanging out with since middle school. Right? And and the author, uh, this, this phrase, the author uses this phrase, young men, to describe uh, this community of friends that, that Re- that's in Rehoboam's life, but it, it literally translates to little boys. So, so he's, he's going to these little boys for advice. And the author's intention here is not to uh, communicate their age, because they're the same age, Rehoboam and his, these young men. What the author is trying to communicate is the quality of their insight and their guidance. How many of you, if you have a big decision to make, you're going to call up my nine-year-old Jude and ask him for wisdom? I hope, hopefully none of you, right? I wonder if you've ever made a decision in your mind or you wanted something that you knew was not good for you, but you wanted it so bad, so the people that you reached out to were the people you knew were going to help you justify your decision rather than the people who you knew were going to ask you difficult questions and offer you real wisdom. Have you ever been there before? I have. I have. This is exactly what is happening with Rehoboam. He wants justification and validation. He does not want wisdom. Verse 12. So what does he do? Well, we all know what he does, right? Three days later, Jeroboam the other guy, and all the people returned to Rehoboam, the king, uh, as the king had said, come back to me in three days. Verse 13, the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice, again, rejecting the advice given to him by the elders. He followed the advice of the little boys and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Okay. So, Rehoboam uh, said he needed three days to make a decision, but what he was doing was he was creating space so that he could find what? Validation, justification. So on the third day, he communicates his decision. Rather than lightening the load of his father, he actually uh, uh, makes it heavier for the people uh, in Israel. And so uh, though the Bible... Now, let me just read this real quick. Verse 15. So the king did not listen to the people... For this turn of events was from the Lord. Kind of a weird little, kind of a weird little add-on to this story, okay? Um, though the Bible says that Rehoboam's decision falls perfectly in line with the purposes and plan of God, it's difficult to overstate the devastation of this one decision. Here's what happens. First, this decision 
actually causes the nation of Israel to divide into two different kingdoms, right? So now you have a divided nation. We know how that feels sometimes, don't we? Okay. Additionally, uh, it, it actually causes Rehoboam to forfeit the northern part of the kingdom to this other guy, Jeroboam. And then finally, uh, Rehoboam is just in a long line of kings that come after him, leaving a legacy of doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, from this point on, there's only six and a half kings that are faithful to God and serve the people of their nation. The rest of them, the Bible says, does what's evil inside of the Lord. So, so here's what we learn. Okay, are you ready for this? You're going to want to write this down. Get your notes out. Come on. I, I'm telling you, you're going to be like, what was that, Casey? Get it out. Okay. The quality of our friendships determines the quality of our decisions. Oh, wait, wait, there's more. I'm telling you, you're going to want to write this down. And the quality of our decisions determines the quality of our life. And the quality of our life determines the quality of our legacy. You want me to say it again so you can take notes? <laughs> the quality of our friends determine the quality of our decisions. The quality of our decisions determine the quality of our life. And the quality of our life determines the quality of our legacy. And where does it begin? It begins with our community. God is so good. Proverbs 13. Walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. What I want to do is I want to give you a tool to help you think through the relationships in your life so that you can follow Jesus well and love the people in your life who may influence you in a direction that you would not be proud of. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, notes. You're going to want to get notes. Okay. Um, I am not an artist. Um, and so actually, is there an artist? Is there somebody in here who can draw three really good concentric circles? Huh? No? Okay, then I'll do it. And you don't have the right to judge. Okay. All right, let's do this. Uh, we have this circle. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's a good start. Uh-oh. Oh, baby. I didn't even practice. That's pretty good. I give myself an 85%. Uh-oh. This is where it all comes together. Oh, my gosh. I want to drop the mic. Okay. That was pretty darn good. Okay, can you see this over here? Okay, so now, when, when you think about your life, there, there are really, uh, there's, there's a million ways to think through your relationships. Here's one way that's been really helpful to me, okay? The middle circle is the circle of intimacy. Intimacy. I don't know how to spell it. Am I spell it? Is that an I? Okay, good. Okay, I should have pretended I knew what I was doing. Okay, this is the circle of intimacy. It's, it's, it's set aside for one person and one person only. The person you're going to marry. And there are plenty of reasons for that. Okay? So if you're not married, you don't get to put someone in the circle of intimacy yet. Because there are things within uh, the way that we do life that can only be supported by the relationship and the covenant of marriage, including sex. Okay? All right. I said it. Secondly... We have the, where am I going to go with this? Uh, we're going to go with, um, right here, influence, okay? Then you have the circle of influence, okay? Um, if I told you I made this up, would you believe me? Don't believe me. I didn't make it up. Okay, you have, you have the circle of intimacy, and then the next one is the circle of influence. This is the, this is the relational circle that you invite people into who you want to have influence in your life, Okay? These are the people who, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, these are the people who are serious about God and, and man, you want to be friends with them because uh, you want their wisdom and their encouragement to rub off on you and, and, and the same um, from your life to them, okay? This is the panel of mentors who you're like, man, I, I want to grow in these areas of my life, so bless you. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to invite you into my circle of influence to have influence in my life, okay? Okay. Then you have the circle of concern, okay? Circle of concern. Uh, Dang it. This was going so well, 
Okay, circle of concern. Th this, is the, this is the circle. Uh, this is the relational circle where um, we, we in invite people into our lives because we love them, but we do not give them um, uh, influence in our, in our lives. This is not an all-access circle. Okay? And, and we, don't, we don't invite people into the circle of influence just because we are within the same proximity as them. We're intentional about who we invite into our circle of influence. Okay? And we choose, our, we choose the person uh, for our circle of intimacy from our circle of influence. Does this make sense? So when I was giving influence uh, over to my work friends, uh, I was doing so unintentionally based upon proximity. And so many of us have built a life where we have people in our circle of influence that actually should be in our circle of concern. Okay? We love them. We care for them. We pray for them. We hang out with them sometimes. But we don't hang out with them in environments that they control. We hang out with them in environments that we control. Are there any students in here? Listen, high school students, middle school students, college age kids. This is a difference maker. This is a difference maker. Okay? All right. I want to encourage you to do a relational audit. A relational audit to ensure you have the right people in the right circles. Okay? Okay. Those are pretty good circles. <laughs> All right. Tony, uh, my lovely assistant, uh, would you bring up uh, our illustration? Okay, uh, everybody give Tony a round of applause. Thank you, Tony. All right, Tony, good job. Um, anybody know what this is? It's homemade, by the way, but anybody know what it is, what it's called? What? It's a yoke, right? It's a yoke. Now, in the passage, in the passage that we just read, yoke shows up like seven times. And in the passage, um, yoke is actually, uh, it's a symbol for like load, responsibility, um, and, and that kind of a thing, okay? And so uh, what a yoke uh, is practically is it actually is a pairing mechanism that, um, that couples two animals together in order to get some work done, right? So, so like, you know, one ox is like this and the other ox is over here and, um, and, and they're like pulling a tractor or something or a plow to get work done on the farm, right? Now, um, I'm probably going to mess this up, okay? Uh, now, it was, it was most often used to pair in uh, a more experienced and mature oxen with a less experienced and uh, immature oxen for two reasons. One, just to get work done, but also to train and influence the younger ox, all right? Here's, here's the point. Some of us have yoked ourselves to foolish little boys, per se, We've given, we've invited the wrong people into our circle of influence. And because we've done so, they're pulling us and inviting us and influencing us in a direction that we're not all that proud of. That's good. And we're making decisions and we're experiencing a future that we wish we weren't experiencing. Right. Okay? Um... Rehoboam should have listened to the elders. Amen. Man, he did such a good job creating space and going to the right people first. Unfortunately, he didn't give them permission to influence his decision-making process. You and I need to do a better job of inviting the right people who are older men and older women into our life to speak on areas where they have expertise. Okay? Let me say this. There is no person, there is no super mentor who can speak into your every area of your life, right? So what we need to do, in fact, that's too much prep. Like I can't, like if you have a financial burden, guess what? Don't come to me. I, I got guys for that, right? If you need counseling, 
I'm not your guy, right? I would not go to me if I needed counseling. <laughs> but if you're like, man, I need to know what my next step in my relationship with God is. I'm your guy. I'm your guy. So asking someone to be a super mentor in your life is actually way too much pressure and it's foolish. So what, I, what I've done and I encourage you to do is build a panel of mentors. Someone you can go to periodically and say, hey, uh, I've, I've put together a budget and I'd like for, for you to put your eyes on it and give me some feedback. So can I buy you lunch? Or, hey, man, uh, my marriage is in a season of, of difficulty and, and I just really respect your marriage and your family. Can I, can I buy you a beer and can we go out and can I just share my story with you and, and can you give me feedback? Okay? Find those people with a level of expertise in areas that, you, that are important to you in your life and, and, and periodically reach out to them when you need their wisdom in that area, okay? And always pay. Always buy their meal. Always buy their drink. Honor them. Honor them, okay? All right. So, so who are those men and women that we need to yoke ourselves to, right? Okay. Finally, um, you need some friends in your life. You need to yoke yourself to some peers. Some people that, man, they're going in the same direction as, as you. Uh, you don't call them for expertise, but you share your life with them. Uh, and maybe there is a, a certain time where you ask for their wisdom. But for the most part, man, you're just encouraging each other. You're praying for each other. You're, you're going to the fake pumpkin patches and the fake uh, Christmas tree farms together. I'm from the Northwest. Like, we have real things, okay? <laughs> we stopped going to Lowe's parking lot last year to get our tree. And we just, we just, we're like, fake tree it. We just fake tree it. <laughs> but who, who are those people? Who are those people that they're going in the same direction? They're going to, they know your goals and they encourage you to work towards those goals and achieve those goals. Financial goals, spiritual goals, family goals, professional goals, health goals. Who are those people? And don't, don't invite people in based upon proximity. Invite them in intentionally. And and let me just tell you what I look for. I enjoy them. I enjoy them. And they're going in the same direction as me. They're life-giving people. They're life-giving people, okay? All right, Tony, Tony actually made this. Isn't that good? I love it. I love it. Okay, that's your yoke. Some of us, some of us need to uh, unyoke ourselves from some people in our life, and, and, and we need to yoke ourselves to others, okay? All right, uh, Jose, you want to come up here, and um, we'll finish off here in a minute. Um, after a year of trying to follow Jesus on my own, Remember, I followed Jesus pretty well, and then I started hanging out with my work friends, and I just, I wasn't following Jesus very well. Finally, now after two years, uh, I, I started to get really serious and really intentional about the relationships I was inviting to influence my life. Um, I started serving a ministry. I got serious about church, um, and one of the biggest, best decisions I made was to join a community group um, with other guys my age and season of life who were encouraging me and uh, challenging me and keeping me accountable to the goals that I had in my life. And, um, and uh, these were the guys who, when it was time to get married, I was looking at this group saying, um, which of these guys do I want to be groomsmen in my life, okay? So if you fast forward just two years after blowing my life up, I found myself in a room of other leaders and other pastors whom I respected. And I remember that moment where I'm in that staff meeting with like six or seven other men and women and I asked myself, how in the world did I end up here? How did I get here? How did I get here? And I was, I was overwhelmed with gratitude. And one of the reasons was while there's many reasons, beliefs and habits and self-control or the lack thereof, one of the main reasons was because I got serious about the, the kind of person I was inviting to influence my life. And those friendships during that season of my life changed the trajectory of my life. 
I want to read one more passage to you and then we'll, uh, we'll grab our second cup of coffee. Jesus, man, I love him. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, many of us in this room need to unyoke ourselves and re-yoke ourselves to different other humans. Some of you need to yoke yourself today to, to the person of Jesus. What he's talking about here is when a rabbi would travel around and do teaching, the rabbi would have a yoke or a list of rules required to obey in order to follow that rabbi. A yoke, a burden, an obligation. And Jesus says, hey, look, that, that burden of religion, that the labor of, he says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Hey, when you follow me, you're not gonna feel weighted down. I'm actually going to give you life. Some of us need to yoke ourselves and our lives to the person and work of Jesus today. All right. Uh, close your eyes. I want to invite you to pray with me. If you're here today and you want to uh, yoke yourself to the person of Jesus, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. You need to know that you were made for a relationship with God. Our sins separated us from that opportunity and there's nothing we can do to close that gap and so god in his love sent his one and only son jesus to live the perfect life die the death that we deserve and come back to life three days later and anyone who puts their trust and faith in jesus christ alone gets to experience and have eternal life eternal life begins now and it lasts forever with god so if you're here today and you want to yoke your life to jesus on the count of three i just want you to raise your hand and I'll pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to put a tracking device on you. Just want to pray for you. If you're here and you want to yoke your life to Jesus, raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Raise it up. Raise it up. Awesome. You can put it down. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Let's pray together. Nobody prays alone, out loud. Let's say these words. Jesus, I give you my life today because you love me. I yoke my life to yours. Give me your spirit and help me follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Good job. Can we give that guy a hand?